let, let's first discuss some of the elements of your speech. The first thing I think is really what I would like to ask each of the three uh, panel members. Uh, is to go back to this idea of the good life. So, so we'll start with Wim van Gorberg first. Uh, you have a, a long distinguished career at the Rabobank. Uh, you, you, you've been retired some time and are chairman of various uh, well, kind of charities, but also chairman of a non-executive board member of various companies. Twelve years ago, you, um, well, you retired as chief financial officer of a wonderful bank, uh, Rabobank. Of course, you were not paid as much as bankers are paid today, but you, you know you were comfortably off. So, you, is there a sense that you could afford to now run the Nexus Institute, your chairman, to, 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 to fill in your life in a more interesting way? Whereas in the book, uh, is this good life? Uh, is it something? Is it a fairly elitist thing? Uh, is a question uh, mm -hmm. that maybe it's tough to say that to somebody who is trying to struggle to make ends meet. And they say, you, you just work 15 hours, you work less hours, and they can't even buy the food for the children. So, so in, in what sense is this good life in you know, talking to you as an economist? Maybe partially colored by your own experience. Is it something for, 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 for our type of people, or is it really something which we can offer to the common man as well? I don't think that is the question, whether a, a, a small number of people have a high income or does that have an effect of the good life of all society? There it comes more to a, a uh, let's say, a policy of bringing employment to give people yeah. the chance to be participate in, in society. Uh, I know a certain even distribution of income, but then not, uh, has some value, of course. But um, I, I guess you should make a distinction be, be, between a, a, a personal income and a, a, a social policy. So, 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 so a quick intermezzo, but you're going to get proper. So, so could you just give a yes or no answer? Is for you having a relatively equal distribution of income uh, part of your good life? Yeah, because it's the basis of respect. You can't have respect if incomes are too unequally uh, divided. Okay, okay. So, and some of your policies will go in that direction as well, because you have a progressive consumption tax and, and things like that. So we'll come towards, to that. Yeah, yeah, towards, towards equality. Equality. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> now we come to Jeroen. Uh, uh, Jeroen Kremers. Uh, so, so again, the same question to you, and uh, as a reaction to the lecture, and then we, we, we go more details. What's the good life for you? Are banks really uh, contributing to the good life? And, uh, well, have a go. I mean, I, if you ask me that question personally and also reading the book, which, which by the way, I thought was a great book, um, I think the distinction between leisure and work is not so black and white. Um, and I believe very much in the vein of the other speakers that um, it's really about the quality of work. And uh, so I would seek progress more in terms of making work fulfilling uh, than to say, you know, it's black and white, you know, work is a slog and leisure is uh, great. Personally, I can um, completely enjoy my uh, leisure. I'm not uh, somebody who works uh, all the time, uh, takes no holidays, etc. But I do think that work also needs to be fulfilling. It's about participation, but also about uh, using your skills, developing, doing new things, being creative, making a contribution to others. Uh, that would be my view. So you need a well-functioning economy. And I think uh, banks can uh, contribute to that. Can. I mean, there are, of course, a number of conditions for that, uh, which maybe we'll talk about later. What can we do about the current financial crisis? And have you got any views on that? I've got lots of views on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but where, where I, if we want to fix this financial crisis properly, I think we should have less fixation with short-term economic growth. Because this, the, the, the economic problems that we are in are extremely deep. And I think, for example, the, the, the British government made a major mistake by basically telling the British people it's going to be tough for a couple of years, but by the end of this government, we should be out of the abyss. I think the true story should have been, it might very well take us two governments, two periods of government. Ten years, ten years. Ten years to, to, get, out of this, uh, to, to get out of this mess. 
And I think that we are so, central bankers and politicians are so extremely worried about there still being an economy tomorrow that we're doing all sorts of uh, things that are extremely risky. Like monetary policies are extremely unorthodox um, and never before have, bal have uh, central banks increased their balance sheet to such an extent as is happening now. And we do not know what the long-term effects uh, will be, but it is uh, extremely uh, uh, risky. I also think, I, I just said that I think the, the basic problem of the financial crisis is the undercapitalization of the financial sector. And I think it does not have... Can you say that in a bit normal words? So that the yeah, so that uh, banks are working with too much debt. <laughs> when things go wrong, just a little bit, they go bankrupt and they have to rely on the state. That is basically it's wrong. It's a state-supported economy. So when they Financial make profits, when they make profits, when they it's for make them. profits, they have bonuses, them, and when and they make losses, it's for the state. Yes, and that is the moral problem of the financial system. But it's essentially an institutional problem. They have so you to don't see a problem of lack of aggregate demand. No. Well, of course that is. I mean, there. You do, I mean that, do you that think is, the unemployment we have now in, in the UK, for example, or in Europe? That, is, that it, is, a, is it voluntary or involuntary? No, it's, that's a big problem and it has to do with a co complete crisis of confidence. But what really should happen in the financial sector is that banks and insurance companies are adequately capitalized. Why are, and, and, and I think everybody knows that. Uh, the policymakers know that that has to happen. And, and how do and you, you capitalize them? And so why is it not, what does it mean well, to why is it not happening? Because in the short run, it might lead to less extension of loans. So in the short run, it might lead to a little bit less economic growth. I think those dangers are exaggerated. I think if you really require banks to have adequate capital, yeah, yeah, what they, will, they cannot give these high salaries anymore. They'll have to moderate their uh, remuneration. <coughs> that way they can recapitalize much quicker than is happening okay. right now. But the fear of short-term economic downturn, which is in the current circumstances extremely understandable, but prevents us from taking the measures that are truly necessary in, in a true reform of the Okay, so, so, so summarizing you, perhaps a little bit, to, to, you know, making a bit of a caricature of you, you say it's, it's, there may be a lack of active aggregate demand, there may be change in unemployment, but the real, that's not my concern, I'm a bit like Dr. Panglos, we have to seek it out, but we have to really solve the prior financial problem of the banks. They have to be recapitalized. If that means that means that they have to build up their, their, their balance sheets, if that means that they're not lending out enough money to the economy and the economy is a bit slow, we just have to wait it out in 10 years. Some, now some, some my, problems um, you just need to sit out. Yeah, I, I know. I hear it very clearly, and it's, it's a very strong view. Uh, my, you don't my, claim so now the word of a real banker. Okay, so my view is that my view... Sorry, I should my, correct. Hans has been a banker in his young days. So, so. Uh, I work for a government-owned bank, but anyway... Uh, so, um, Sorry. So, so, so my view is that a lot of what was said is uh, I don't disagree with. Also, like you were saying earlier, that also the IMF is learning lessons from this crisis. So I think the crisis in part is learning technical lessons, eh? bad economics, good economics. But what I must say, I do like very much about Professor Skidelsi's book is that I think there is also a moral element to it all. Um, because, you know, the technique will not bring us, uh, you know, to, to, the, to the perfect understanding. There are things we don't understand. It has to do with behavior. It has to do with behavior that is not always, uh, you know, something you can steer with economic incentives. It has to do with personal responsibility. And I think um, uh, it is interesting then to look at the crisis in Canada. Canada is a country that has exactly our economic model, capitalism, markets, modern economics, but went through the crisis very well, and uh, that is because there, in uh, policy, in the banks, there is just a bit more conservatism. People are just a little bit more prudent, a little bit more careful. Uh, some modesty, some moderation, and these are words I see in the book, and I think that they are part of the story. Wim? Well, <coughs> as, as the panel proceeds, I'll start calling you Wim. So uh, that's okay, thank you, Sharon. 
I, I guess I agree also that the um, <clears throat> a part of the financial crisis is that um, our, our financial system, especially the banks, are very well undercapitalized. So that should be restored in one way or another. And I tend to agree with Hans that uh, if the price for that will be in the coming period a lower rate of growth, that would be acceptable. But it is hard to manage that and to manage expectations. And, and what you see at the very moment in time, since the, the well, our institutions and especially, of course, the European politicians are, are not able to define a sort of path that leads to, into a new situation, it, it's hard to get trust for that. If you see the opposite in the United States, for instance, there they also recognized that the banks were very well undercapitalized after the crisis and restored it in a very short period of time. And that is important that, 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 that you do that. So th that's, that's one remark. The second is that if you don't do that, uh, it's, it's, it's very hard to handle the, the, the lack of demands because uh, as long as you have not a trustful path to a, a, a new situation, governments are more or less restricted in, in, in their doing um, because everybody is uncertain about it. Um, but I think the main thing, and that adds to, to what Jeroen has said, is that we should make this not a sort of technical debate about 10% of capital ratio of banks or, or whatever, but we should have some kind of an idea what kind of banks there will be in five or seven years' time, not only from a safety point of view, I mean that you bring back then the probability of default because they are better capitalized at that moment in time. But what is their asset side? What kind of activities do they give credit on? How is their connection with the real economy? And I, I think it is very important that, that you define that because only talking about a reduction in budget to 3% of national income or capitalizing banks on, on, on a higher level is a too abstract uh, approach to the system and you, and you never can get public support for, for, for that kind of idea because you only see the negatives of it. So what, what, what you really sh should try to, to define is what I would call a new social contract between the financial sector on the one hand and society on, on the other hand, that you define uh, what kind of social problems uh, you, you can expect that the financial sector will be helpful to, to solve them. Maybe you talk about, um, let's say, uh, alternative sources of energy. You, you can talk about all kinds of things, but as long as there is not a search of common goal for, for, for why you do this, all, the, all these things uh, to, to bring banks in a better position, uh, in, in relation with society, I, I guess it will up, uh, uphill that. Like, how, how could banks be reformed in a way that they would contribute in some way or another to the good life? Well, the first, first thing they could do is to be, uh, first step in reform is to make them much more customer friendly. Um, I mean, that, that's probably the most important thing for most people, that they actually get a service from their banks. Um, which, um, which um, um, you know, satisfies them. Um, of course, it's very important to have a banking system that doesn't collapse every 10 years. Um, and, 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 and for that, you do need a lot of restructuring. I mean, I'd have more competitive banks, I'd separate out various things. All these are well discussed. Um, but I'm not actually that interested in them, I'm, I'm afraid, not being a banker. I mean, if I were a banker, I'd be immensely interested and I'd regard this as the core of the problem. Banks must be allowed to heal and they must be encouraged to heal. And there are lots of ways this can be done, and they're very, very useful. But that is not the way to get out of the present hole. The banks are not part of the solution for the present problem. They're too damaged to do that. Um, and, and as for the idea that, um, you know, um, we wait 10 years, 10 years, that's 20 to 30 in the life of a young person. And, and, and what, what's more, I would quote Keynes, in the long run, we're all dead. Um, if, you, if you say, well, look, we can't do much now, it's all very difficult because the banks have to be given time, they've got to be recapitalized, where are they going to get the capital from, this is a very serious problem, let's have a new social contract, and all blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, there are a lot of people whose lives are being completely wasted. 
Um, not only people who are actually unemployed, but people who are much less fully employed than they'd like to be. So that's where my moral, I get very angry when I hear a lot of this stuff. Um, because I'm not, I'm not contemptuous of the technicality behind it, I have a great respect for that. But it seems to be missing the point. Um, <laughs> But cur currently, with the, the British government is being heavily criticised uh, along these lines uh, for not doing enough to support the economy. Uh, it is already, uh, it, uh, and perhaps people will find this very abstract, but they already have a, a debt of uh, over 90% of GDP. It's growing at 10% per year. But why? Pr approximately. But why? Well, why? N not because they are not spending enough. <laughs> I mean... Uh, to me, it is beyond belief that the British uh, economy can get out of these problems by the, uh, by the government creating even a bigger deficit of over 10%. Uh, that, 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 that is going to be paid by those young people that are waiting for an opportunity on the job market, but they will have to pay that debt in 10 years' time. And so it's very easy to say uh, this is at the expense of the young generation who are now jobless. Well, first of all, the British economy is still doing relatively well in terms of, uh, of jobs. It's shrinking. But, the, but, these, it's pe shrinking. but these people... Yeah, but, and, yes. and, the, and, but how, and all the forecasts, all but, the forecasts say that it's, but shrinking, if, if, that it's shrinking, if the that British, it's shrinking because of the tightening of the fiscal policy of the government. But if the, uh, if the British gov uh, economy would grow more by increasing deficit spending of the British government, it would be one of the best performing economies in Europe because it has a very high deficit already. Mevrouw, er, er, het probleem is niet leuk. Het probleem is niet leuk en er zijn geen leuke oplossingen. Oké. Okay. Ieder, iedereen die u vertelt dat er een leuke oplossing voor is, die vertelt u niet de waarheid. Can we please speak in British, in, in English? So, having heard what the, the, some members of the public are saying, uh, I, I think they've got a point. Uh, and, and I'm going to, so, so what they're saying, I, I will translate, is a kind of certain anger with the kind of saying, saying that, look, there is no solution, we have to, we have to stick it out. Because I think, if I know you well enough, you have a solution. And uh, let, me, let me put it, so monetary policy has kind of run its course, because you can't lower interest rates anymore. We see Europe, the Netherlands and Germany in particular, suffering from some budgetary anorexia. That the kind of it, it, it like like a do, you know the, the the more we stick within three percent, the better. And and I think and and you get angry. So 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 what would you you're 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 the Chancellor of the Exchequer, not just for the UK but for all of Europe. The world, maybe. No, no well, <laughs> let's not go too far. <laughs> what would you do? Well, you see, I think I'm not only morally angry, but quite intellectually angry. Because I understand. I think, yeah. I, think this, I think, with respect, I think you've got the story the wrong way around. Um, at, governments are trying to cut their deficits. They are trying to cut their deficits, and their deficits are growing. Why are they not successful in cutting their deficits? They are cutting spending. They are cutting spending, and their economies are shrinking. Now, one of my position is that is not the way to reduce your deficit and it's going to fail. I let's go back to some of these general questions and maybe if, if the panel members don't mind but let me also rephrase. Have you got a particular question? Because I have many questions to ask on these general issues but now I have to put it back to you and ask an inspiring question for, Mr. for Lord Skidelsky. Well uh, I, I also got the impression that uh, we have uh, somebody, somebody from the Anglo-Saxon world coming over to the Rhineland world and telling, him about, telling us about how the Anglo-Saxon world is, is, is not working well and how uh, we should, they should strive for less work. Here in the Rhineland world, we are actually doing that to a more extent. Um, is, it, is it not so that the Anglo-Saxon world should simply um, use our more Rhinelandic models and, uh, and, and okay, so, so, use so, our Rhinelandic models? models. So, so, so we had some debate on this earlier on, but, but let's go back to that. So we, we noted before that in the US and the UK, they work many more hours than, say, in the Netherlands and the rest of Europe. Should, 
it's really could part of your book be read to say that British readers be a bit more like the Rhinelandic models? Well, the answer is yes. Yes is my answer to your question. And in fact, in various bits of the book, I didn't have time to go into it this, this morning, we do draw on the Rhineland model. And also on Scandinavian social democracy, we also draw on Catholic, Catholic social theory, which has been very influential in the creation of the, 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 the European and the German social market economy. We say there are different models of, uh, different models of how a, a, a capitalist system works. And we pay particular, we ask a particular question about how the Dutch have managed to do um, that. So it's not a question of, you're right, I mean, in a way, we have our own, we're complaining about our own conditions in Britain and the United States and how they've fallen short of, short of what other countries have been able to do. Um, but we still think, having said all that, there's a bit of a lag. I think you could do more. Um, uh, along, along the, the lines of economic possibilities for our grandchildren, but certainly the Netherlands would be very high up um, in, in, in um, you know, Keynes would, would, be much, would be more favorable to what, what's happened in the Netherlands than it would to what's been happening in the UK. You didn't have a Thatcher or a Reagan, and that was your great, um, your <laughs> great uh, benefit. I'm a philosopher who's interested in economics, and it seems to me that in your definition of leisure, there is quite a lot of work, because in fact you call it work freely and joyfully undertaken. You call it purposefulness without purpose. So would I be right to think that, in fact, what you're saying is that the good life consider, consists of having a purpose and doing things and creating things and making things and enjoying that life, but only some of those hours should be spent in paid work, and we should liberate the rest of the time to do that with our lives. Yeah, having your own purpose. Particularly. Yes, your own purpose. Not the, own the, purpose. the crucial distinction between the work is that it's not working on somebody else's creative yeah, project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or a creative project as a yeah. team that you're I mean, happy with. I mean, we try to distinguish between extrinsic and intrinsic reasons for activity. Right. We're in problems of semantics, and they're quite difficult because we attach rather precise meanings to work and leisure, and we're trying to overcome that polarity. But um, I'm not sure we've found exactly the right language.